Hi, I'm Shay Oliver. Welcome to The Priority Paradigm. These are stories of amazing people who have made radical changes in their life for something more important. Today, I'm joined by Andre Von Hall, and he's got an absolutely fascinating, moving story to tell us. So without further ado, Andre, please tell us your story. Shay, thank you very much for including me. Well, it's... Uh... It's a long story, but uh, let's uh, share it. I was born in uh, Buenos Aires, in Argentina, and I grew up both in the city and in the country. We had a ranch, and uh, so I had the uh, duality of being exposed to two lifestyles. Wow. And I stayed there through my military service, and uh, when I did my military service, I ended up being a waiter for the officers. And It was a very scary time in Argentina with a dirty war going on. Mm. And a lot of my friends and colleagues uh, had been killed or uh, there was, uh, well, there was turmoil. It was uh, the early 70s. And uh, I ended up being waiter for the officers, as I said, and I fell in love with the idea of working in the hospitality industry. Mm. So I ended up going to Germany, to Hamburg, Germany, to work at the Hotel Vier Jahreszeit in, in, in Hamburg. That is one of the 10 best hotels in the world. Wow. And I started as a pot washer. And uh, so way at the bottom of the totem pole. And then I was promoted dishwasher. I went all through the kitchen and I worked in all places for two and a half years. And I was going to go to a hotel school in Lausanne in Switzerland. And my general manager says, no, no, no. The future is in America, Andre. Go to an American hotel school. And he was a graduate of the Lausanne Hotel School. And he was clairvoyant. But then he went, one day, he, while I was applying to universities in the United States, he told me, Andre, my friend, the general manager of the Ritz in Paris, needs someone with a, a language skill. So the next day, I was moving to Paris to go and work, work at another one of the 10 top hotels in the world. And I was a telex operator, which was the instant messaging of the 60s and 70s and 80s. And... Uh, and then I was a front desk clerk and it was fun. You know, I got to meet uh, celebrities and uh, get to really be in another country. And I got admitted to Cornell University. I came to the States and I graduated from school in 1980. And I worked in New York at two hotels in Miami, at two hotels in Washington, D.C., then in Burlington, Vermont. I was general manager for the first time of the Radisson Hotel in Burlington. And then I uh, moved to Atlanta to run the Hyatt Regency in Atlanta and the Hyatt in Louisville, Kentucky. And I came to Denver to run the Adams Mark Hotel, a big 1,200-room hotel. And when they put it up for sale, we didn't want to move. The kids were doing great in school. So we decided to stay, and I uh, became the CEO of a historic Denver Athletic Club, a uh, very old, traditional city club. And I was there for 10 years, and then I suddenly lost my eyesight. I was a uh, avid, avid cyclist. Oh, man. I would do 5,000 miles a year on my bike. And wow. I went, went on a bike ride and uh, got to the top of the mountain before my friends and I laid down to rest. And I didn't know that those actions were going to precipitate the most dramatic change in my life. And uh, my optic nerve stopped getting blood because I stopped working out, I had low blood pressure, the opening through which my optic nerve goes into the eye is very small for me and it constricts the optic nerve. And I ended up being diagnosed with something called non-arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. So wow. going to, rushing to the hospital, they, uh, after many, many tests, uh, they determined that in two weeks I would be blind. Oh my gosh. Yes, and uh, so, there was significant uh, change that uh, precipitated other changes that came after that. Because a year after that, I lost my jaws as CEO of the Denver Athletic Club. Oh my gosh. And uh, we sold our house and we moved closer to town so that I would be uh, closer to transportation. Then uh, I got diagnosed with a nasty cancer and it metastasized a year later. Oh my God. So I went through uh, a lot of treatment and I was on an experimental drug. I've got the same cancer that President Carter has. And I don't know if you remember, but a couple of years ago, he went to the hospital to die and they yes. tried an experimental drug on him. Yes. And he was cured. And uh, so I have the same cancer, the same treatment. And right now the doctors are confident that uh, I'm uh, cancer free for a year. So uh, awesome. things are looking good. But I had to reinvent myself. 
And I started becoming a professional speaker. And uh, I uh, thought that um, I had a message to share because what happened is that when I became blind, I was deep, deep in despair, right? And uh, I, I was judging my situation based on my ignorance about blindness. And I was using my prejudices and my preconceived ideas about blindness rather than assessing what is my potential? What, what can a blind person do? And it is so that my friends and my family woke up my curiosity on transitioning into blindness. And one of the past presidents of the Denver Athletic Club, the very next day of my diagnosis, showed up in my office and he says, Andre, do you realize how fortunate we are that here in Colorado, we have one of the very few centers for the blind where they train blind people how to live in blindness. And I went to see them and here are their brochures and all the information. And we also have a, the, the, the very rare thing that there is a store here that sells supplies to the blind. Oh. And why don't we go there right now and go in, in and see what tools are available so we can give you the tools before you're blind so you can start to use them. It was at that moment that I realized that blindness was something I had to transition into and not wait for. And that I had to take action. I couldn't wait. So... Interesting thing is in, in my Bible study group, we had been talking about what is humility. And the definition I like the best is the one that said, it's the ability, the ability to accept help. And I was not a humble man. I did not know how to accept help. And so it made that transition extra difficult, right? Because I did not want help. I could do it on my own. And... Uh, as the days went by, I realized that I needed help. And one of the most difficult transitions was finding out that to learn to use a cane for the blind, I needed to go to the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation and I would get a caseworker who would give me a trainer. And I was too proud. The idea that my, I was again judging what a caseworker is and the idea that I would have a caseworker uh, humiliated me, you know, and uh, I did not want to go down that road. But I realized that um, I could not do it solo and that uh, if I was going to be a humble man, I needed to accept the idea that people out there are willing to help and organizations set up to help people become and, re and remain active members of society. So, I dove in and uh, I had to use blinders because I could still see at the time when they were training me to use a cane. But so imagine your whole life, you rely on your eyes to guide you through the world. Right. And now you have to transition to using your ears and your cane. So your cane is a probe that you use in front of you to find obstacles. Okay. And you use your ears to enhance your perception of the world around you. Sure. So we started at a small street and they, they, they call it the minor, minor intersection. And they tell me and say, okay, stand here and listen. Listen to any kind of activity. And if you think you can hear a car and it's within a hundred yards, don't go into the street. But listen, can you hear a skateboarder? Can you hear a bicycle? Okay. Uh -huh. And it is stressful when you're in that corner and you want to put that cane in your foot on the street, okay, blinded. And then you progress. It, it was terrifying, yes. And, and then you progress to a, a minor intermediate intersection. And then you go intermediate, intermediate, intermediate major, and then major, major. Oh, my gosh. My graduation was having to cross a major intersection in Denver that is uh, – Broadway and Colfax, downtown Denver. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I don't yes. like, yeah, that's just not a fun intersection to cross in any situation. Situation, it's true. And, but now what you have to do is stand there and you're not familiar with the pattern of the lights, okay? So you have to stand there and listen, maybe for a whole cycle, maybe two cycles of the light, because 
is there a left turn arrow? Is there a right turn moment? Okay. How long is the pattern for people to go east, west, and north, south? And the, so once you think you've got the pattern down and you say, okay, now I think I can cross, you put that cane in your foot on the street and you've got to be sure, you can't be guessing. And uh -huh. it's a learning process for me, you know, on how to trust your senses and to trust the training and to trust the people that are helping you move on. But uh, yeah. <laughs> It, you know, the transition was so much more. Like, for instance, once you're blind, how do you know how much toothpaste is on your toothbrush? Okay. And, uh, you learn to put the toothpaste on your finger first and then transition it from your finger onto the tip of your toothbrush. And, uh, you know, this all happened in August and uh, my wife's uh, birthday was coming up and I wanted to bake a cake. And I needed to get a teaspoon of vanilla extract not of vanilla, of almond extract. And I'm going like, how do I measure a teaspoon of almond extract? And, you know, have it come out of a little bottle onto a little spoon, and how do you measure it? And I finally figured out, you know, pour the extract into a glass, dip the spoon into the glass, and then put that oh. into your mixture. Sure. Okay. And since, you know, my son has given me a scale that talks to me. So, you know, I have a scale that tells me how much stuff weighs. Okay. And microwaves, you know, are flat when you push buttons, but you can put little dots. So, like where the five is, put a little dot, like a Braille dot. Sure. And then you can feel for it. Then you know that diagonally up is one, diagonally down is a nine, and so on and so forth. So, you can orient yourself different ways. And you start to learn the tricks of operating in the blind world wow the um one of my other difficult transitions was that a good friend of mine uh, tim wolf uh, another hotel operator in town had done 23 boston marathons and uh, he knew how much i like to bike and he says andre why don't you get a tandem and you and i do the elephant rock 100 mile bike ride together Very and cool. i'm like oh, wait I have to be in charge, right? I have to switch gears. I have to do the brakes. And yes, I want to ring the bell. <laughs> and the last thing I want to do is be in the back of your bike, of the bike, looking at your butt all day long. <laughs> and he says, why you worry? You won't see it. And I'm like, well, you've got a point. <laughs> but um, no, I did not want to do it. And I again realized that I was not being humble. I was being prideful. And I could be proud on my couch or I could be a little bit humble and get on the back of the bike and feel the burn in my legs again and feel the wind in my face, you know, and sure. feel the wet going down my back. Yes. So I bought the tandem and I called Tim and I said, all right, come on over, let's do this. So he came over and I got on the bike on the back and I said, let's go. He said, well, wait a minute. You've got to explain the bike. Let's see, you've got disc brakes, you've got uh, how many gears and how are we going to communicate. And I'm like, oh, Lord, let's, let's figure it out as we go. But we have different management styles, right? So Tim is very deliberate and more intuitive. Mm. And I realized that if I don't give up some of my CEO <laughs> style, he's not coming back. I have to be open. And that transition was difficult for me. And I incorporate that into my speech when I am a keynoter that I tell people and I say, you know, even when you're in charge, if a change comes, are you willing to give up your position of being in charge so you can listen to other people? And I had to learn the, to listen to Tim. But then we got writing and, uh, and I go to Tim, Tim, you're in the wrong gear. You're killing me, right? He's this unbelievable athlete. That, <laughs> and he liked high revolution and low thing. resistance. And, and I liked it the other way around. So I had to tell him and say, Tim, you need to slow down revolution. <laughs> so now, even if you are in charge in a situation, are you willing to listen to your team? So Tim is a captain. I'm the stoker. But if he doesn't listen to me and he sets a pace that 
that doesn't work for us. We're walking the bike in five miles, right? Right. So those were the learning things that, that came out of these things. And while we finally worked out the pace and whatever, we got to Chatfield Dam, which is a climb and a short one, but we argued all the way to the top. <laughs> so I've learned that always in life, just as things are going well, there's going to be a Chatfield Dam. There's always going to be a wrench thrown into things as they're going smoothly. And how do you communicate to adapt? And are you willing to listen to each other and to learn from each other? It's okay for him to challenge me and to say, Andre, why don't you try this? But in a team, you need to be able to go both ways. And he might be the captain, but he needs to be listening to me. So it is those sorts of little lessons that I picked up that have encouraged me to become a professional speaker. Sure. But now I started, I found out that there's a, a group in Colorado called iCycle, E-Y-E Cycle. And okay. we own 22 tandems and we take blind people on bike rides to get them out of the house and get them active. Awesome, awesome. And uh, I, I started to get involved in other blind community things and um, Many of my blind friends, I realized, had guide dogs. And I'm like, I got my cane. My cane is awesome. I don't have to walk the cane. I don't have to poop the cane. <laughs> right? Sure. So I'm going like, I don't want a cane. But I realized that my friends with dogs were a lot more agile and, and able to get places. And then somebody made a, 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 such a revelation of something so simple, you know, like when I went to buy my cane and I found out you use your cane to find obstacles. Uh -huh. Okay. My friends that have guide dogs use them to avoid the obstacles. Okay. Ah. And that gets places a lot faster because they're not looking for obstacles. They're anticipating through their dogs and avoiding them. Sure. So, I decided, fine, I'm going to go and get a dog. And I got mine from Guide Dogs for the Blind, an unbelievable outfit in San Rafael, California. And uh, they trained these magnificent animals. It cost them $100,000 per graduating dog. Wow. And they give them to us completely free of charge. The dog, the harness, the trip to California, the lodging, the training, wow. feeding, everything. So it's it's just unbelievable the organizations and and the, the, the humanity that is out there to help other people remain active members of society in the things that they do so guidance of the blind doesn't take a single penny from government or agencies it's all donations volunteers and people that help out that's fantastic. It is fantastic. So it, it is truly unbelievable what happens out there. So now Pelham, that is his name, Pelham is seven and a half years old. But Pelham and I travel the country speaking on change and being curious. So to me, curiosity is what helped me transition from sighted into blindness. And as I say in my talk, you know, when, when, when um, change comes and it's a difficult change, you can go down the darkness of despair sure. or you can light a candle. Okay. Sure. And my friends and family have taught me the importance of lighting a candle, seeing the positive, seeing what you can do, not what you can't do. Seeing... You know, I ski and uh, with guides, and no, I don't do the trees anymore, and no, the bumps are very difficult, and I don't do them, but I'm skiing. And so, so what do I want to do? Do I want to cry that I can't do the trees anymore? Or what, do I want to rejoice that I'm still out there and doing it? Same thing with cycling. I just completed Ride the Rockies, Awesome. Is, That's fantastic. <laughs> yes. It's my seventh time. 
And we did it as a fundraiser for the homeless. And uh, 58 of us raised $170,000 for the homeless by doing this six day, 450 mile bike ride in Colorado. Wow. So again, you know, it's, um, we are all temporarily abled. Okay. And what do you mean? You, say that I said, again. I said that we're all temporarily abled. Okay. Okay. And, so there's always something that disables us in one way or another. Sometimes it is stress and uh, sometimes it is mental illness and uh, sometimes it's, it's something physical. But at different stages of our lives, we go in and out of being disabled. And what is a disability, you know, and uh, so I'm blind, and, uh, but I can use a cane, I can use a dog, and I use my iPhone, reads everything to me. So Apple has been at the forefront of things. So, you know, it's, it's I can listen to my emails. I connected us on the, my computer because right. I, I can zoom and make things huge on my big, big, big screen here but my computer talks to me. So a moment ago, we got interrupted because my, 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 my computer, as, as things come up, my computer reads them to me. But technology is out there to help me overcome the disability, the, 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 the detractors, if you want, the things that make life hard for my disability. So now the question is, once you've learned to exist are you still disabled oh yeah. what a good question and uh, so yes uh i need help when i get to an airport and it's hard to find a gate and uh, but we found ways of accommodating the needs and right. bring us back into society so you know, we put cutouts on the sidewalk so that uh, people in wheelchairs can, or families with strollers can, can use those. So as society progresses, I think that we've become a lot more, not just tolerant, but accepting of people that are different. Mm -hmm. I'd agree. And, and that is one of the great joys of being in this country. You know, I, um, I remember going back to Argentina to visit my mother when I was in college. And uh, she had moved since from our home into an apartment. And uh, she had become, uh, she was on a wheelchair. And uh, I said, mom, let's go out for a walk. And I go down with the elevator to the lobby and there's no way to get from the lobby to the street. Because oh. the steps. So the doorman and I picked up the wheelchair and got her to the sidewalk. And it's a very old, town where she moved to very beautiful but the sidewalks are all torn up by tree roots and the streets were cobblestones so you know it, it was impossible so after a quarter block it turned around and I realized I couldn't take my mom out for a walk or a roll so we're blessed you know that we live in a country where we care and where we learn, we have to learn then to be humble and to accept the help that is out there to help us transition. So that is the core of my story. And uh, so I, I don't know if you want me to open it up to then questions and we'll have a dialogue. Yeah, no, that Andre, that's, uh, your story is absolutely fascinating. I mean, there is a sense that I just feel radiating off of you that um, you are going to probably get through this challenge one way or the other, even if life was beating you down, you were going to stand up and continue to fight, which is, uh, I think a lot of people struggle with that whole idea that if life has thrown me a curveball, that I can't react, that I'm subject to what life has just given me and I have no control, um, which, right. uh, you know, I'm just, as, as I've listened to you talk, it's, it's very obvious to me you have a spark in you. That is, uh, that is very um, bright and very, and very strong, that you are going to fight even if life kept pounding you down, which is, I think a lot of people struggle with finding that spark inside themselves. Um, you know, it, 
so, so if I might interject, so to yeah. that point, and it, we all have it. We all have it because you, you, you'd be amazed at, at the people that I meet as I do my talks and I travel and, and people that have been beat down by life. And, uh, but as I said, you have the choice. When you get to that point, you choose to curse the darkness or you want to light a candle, right? right? And what I tell people, and I say that the world, don't take the world the way it is. Take the world the way you, are gonna, you choose to make it. <laughs> and uh, you can make the world around you as, as, as something that is your vision of the world and not, so if you are blind, you want to sit inside of the apartment feeling sorry for yourself, we're gonna go out and brave the world, it's scary. It's mm -hmm. scary out there. But there are people that have to overcome mental illness to get out into the world. And there are people that have to overcome other physical limitations and go out into the world. So I believe that we all have that spark. And Einstein was asked uh, once, you know, how come you're so smart? And he says, oh, no, I'm not smart. I am curious. Okay. <laughs> and so... I used to say that thing, that it's about attitude, uh -huh. but I don't know how to now go in and say, Shay, I want to wake up your attitude. But I think that I know how to wake up your curiosity and, and, and how to challenge you to be curious about getting out of the darkness and coming into the light. Okay, so, tell me how you do that. How is it if you're that person who's, either wanting to make a change and don't know how to do it or life is throwing something at you. How do you spark your own curiosity? Well, in my case, other people did it, right? Like my friend Jack Barker that sure. uh, brought the, the, the Colorado Center for the Blind information and took me, physically took me to the store and the people that showed me what guide dogs do, okay? You, you, you have to have an open mind. You, you know, you can't close yourself completely in. But the thing is, it's, it's just challenging yourself and saying, what would happen if I walked from here to the door? Okay. And realizing you're going to bump your head, you're going to bump your, your shin, and uh, that, that it's, it's not going to be easy. But understanding that those difficulties can be overcome and just take them one little step, one little bit of curiosity at a time. And sometimes it takes other people to do it, to drag you into it, right? And to say, come on, let's try this. And just like with your child who's like overabundant curiosity and, uh, you know, they, uh, why is the sky blue? Why is this? Why is that? Okay, so, so forth. Right. And, and I am afraid that we have it throughout our lives uh, being told to be less curious, and uh, an organization writes a book of standard operating procedures. Right, right. And, and, and then the employees start looking at this, the same old process because you can't change them. It's in the book. It's the way it's, it is. This is how we do it. Right. And in today's world, if you always do what you always did, you're out of business. Okay. And uh, there was a time that it, if you always did what you if you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got, and that that worked for centuries, right? If you were the saddle maker to the king, and you continued to make great saddles, and you just made small improvements every year, okay, you you always would be the saddle maker to the king. Sure. Then, then the horseless carriage comes out, and it totally disrupts you. So, being curious about just a little bit is not enough anymore. You, you've got to expand that curiosity. But I'm saying begin small. Begin by exploring something small. And you know, when, when, when Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone from the stage, and it was 11 years ago, it's only 11 years ago, okay? Think about it. Research in Motion, owners of BlackBerry, okay? Mm -hmm. We're king of the mountain. Big Blackberry time. is the one we all had, right? Yep. And they became curious about the iPhone. And they took it apart and they formed focus groups. But what did we all say? What did we like about our Blackberries? It was the keyboard, right? The buttons. Okay. Yeah. And 
so they were curious. So I'm saying curiosity can get you so far. And I know that I'm Monday morning quarterbacking here. But, but the problem is, is you remember I talked earlier about judging and assessing? Yes. And they judged the iPhone based on their prejudices about preferring the buttons and thinking that uh, it wasn't enterprise, for enterprise friendly. But that was the first generation. Now, are you curious enough to assess what the future of it is? So do you judge your child based on their past performance or do you assess them based on their potential by being curious about where they can go? So it's a long answer to your question, but I, I think that to wake up your curiosity, we begin with small steps, but clearly understanding that if you always do what you always did, you're out of business in your personal life or in your professional life. Sure. So be curious, be curious about, so set up an environment of curiosity in your workplace, in your home and in yourself. Okay. So that your employees challenge what you're doing, that you challenge what you're doing. You challenge the bank on how they want to do business with you. You challenge your peop your, your, the people you interview, like me, okay, and being curious about us, okay. Sure, and I no, think that, that's exactly what I'm doing. I mean, it's fascinating. What's that? It's fascinating listening to people like you who have done this right. and who are, who are on a path. So what I hear in many ways is challenge your own personal assumptions about everything. Am, am I on the mark of what you believe? Yes. How do we yes. get to what we assume? Because I think a lot of people go through, I don't want to say life is a zombie, but I think a lot of people march. They're, we're conditioned. We go this way. We do this thing. We behave this way. You know, yes. there's, there's a narrative. There's a story of how you should live your life. How do you shake that? How do you get people to not just become curious, but bang on their own assumptions so that they can see that they have these assumptions? Yeah, you know, it, and, and that is the difficult part. And, uh, you know, you, you, you go to a workplace and you tell them, we're going to put a whole new computer system in and we're going to change. And, and they're going like, what's wrong with the current system? Okay, why do we have to learn a new system? And then you implement the new system. And they, instead of seeing the improvements, they only see, how this system is different from the old system, okay? <laughs> yes. And it, so, and that's why they hire people like me to come and speak about change, okay? To open up the eyes of people to understand that, let's, okay, so, so I talk about incremental change, okay? So incremental change is, is when every day you do something a little bit better, you're curious about, you know, it's, it's, uh, you, you change something a little bit. Sure. And, and there's environmental, environmental change. Environmental change is what that happens. Okay. It's your age, you go blind. Okay. Uh, climate change, whatever you want to call it, but that's stuff that happens out there. And then disruptive change. Now, environmental change and incremental change can of course become disruptive. Sure. Absolutely. And uh, so this disruptive change belongs in, in, in all the categories of change. Okay. And the, 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 the thing is that in life, so let's say that you're in a marriage and uh, the, the, the couple begins to change at different rates, okay? okay. So mom stays at home with the kids and her language stagnates. She was in business, she was successful, and so, so forth. But now, she's not growing in the business world and uh, her business language in, in savvy is stagnating and she meets with other moms and is talking about kids and schools and diapers and so, so forth. Okay. Sure. But the husband continues to grow in the organization and develops a whole different language and culture. And if they, the two of them don't discuss things and don't openly exchange information. Okay. They begin to change apart. 
and and uh, they start to like different things. And uh, I'm not saying that one is better than the other, but uh, they, yeah. they start. So what I talk about is become curious about each other and, uh, uh-huh. and share and, uh, and be open to the new ideas and be open to what wife has to say about the child upbringing and uh, be open to hearing about what, is happening in the business world and vice versa. You know, and I said, man, woman roles, reverse them. You know, the guy's the one who stays at home and the wife is the one that goes to work. Certainly. I, it's, it's the same sort of thing, you know. Right. And I, I, I remember I was working at the Fijarszeiten in Hamburg and uh, my, my roommate was Richard and uh, he and I worked in room service. And he had taken English and passed the test for English. And when human resources found out, whatever, they promoted him to floor supervisor for the first two floors. So he was so ecstatic. He invited his girlfriend and myself. We went out to dinner. And uh, he asked her to marry him. Oh, wow. And here I am, a third wheel in this thing. Okay, <laughs> With my uh, disposable income of three months or whatever, I bought a bottle of champagne. And we're toasting. And I say, well, here's to French. And he's going like, what do you mean? You know, and I'm like, well, I said, English got you supervisor. Okay. French will get you manager. (laughs) And he's not, oh, no, I'm done. I'm done. I've got the girl. I've got the job. I'm done. And it took me three decades to understand that Richard is maybe as happy or happier than I am with having stagnated at that level, right? He, his, his lack of curiosity, I could not understand. I could not grasp it. How can you say this is enough? How can you stop? You're 21 years old, okay? And for decades, I was like, how do people do this? But I understand that we have to have all kinds of people. We cannot all be curious about everything and taking us to different levels. So for some people, curiosity about progression in career stopped. But who knows? He might be curious about carpentry and he may have become a tinker toy maker or gay in, in his free time. Or he's curious about other things. And we have to understand that curiosity is not something that it's always about improving ourselves in, 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 in uh, financially or, or, or something like that. It could, be, it could be the curiosity of a doctor on, on researching on, on how to find a cure for something. It could be the curiosity of my dishwasher who comes to me and tells me, you know, in my last place of work, our glasses didn't come out spotted, but here they do. And we use this detergent in our dishwasher. You mind if we try it? Okay, so allowing him to be curious about that, but me being curious enough to hear him out. And again, long, long answer, and it's difficult. So we're not all equally curious, okay? And so like my wife told me, you'll never make me curious about computers. And I love technology. (laughs) And that's okay. And that's okay, right? We can't make everybody curious about everything. Right. there's so much to learn in the world. Absolutely. Where, where, where do you take? Where, let, where do you let your curiosity take you? Certainly. So, as I hear your story, you have you were surrounded by some very supportive people as yes. you went through some very difficult times in life. What do you do, or what do you tell people who are in a situation where either they want to change, or change is coming and they need to change? but they're surrounded by people who won't be supportive of who like who they are and want them to stay who they are, but they want to change. You know, I'm going to digress a little bit and take you in a little bit different direction. So I am an avid driver as I don't drive, right? Sure. And uh, four years ago when Uber was in its nascent stages here, okay, whatever, I called an Uber and I had Hamid who came and picked me up. Okay. That beautiful black car. And Hamid, how do you like this Uber thing? And he's like, I hated it. He says, you know, when it came out, 
I have a small limo company. Ah. And uh, I've got a, a couple of stretches and three thumb cars. And, uh, and I was terrified. And then one of my drivers told me, why don't you join Uber? And I nearly fired him. He says, I was so angry. How, can, how dare he suggest I join Uber? And totally indignant, I told my wife, you know what this idiot told me? I should get an Uber account. And the wife told me, why don't you? <laughs> <laughs> And so now I'm surrounded by people that are forcing me to be curious and, and explore this, okay? And kicking and screaming, I opened an account. And he says, now I'm a lot busier. My margins are smaller, but we are a lot busier. Ah. Now, I like the story of, of, of the, uh, the, the, the guy to, tells the plumber and uh, says, so how much do I owe you? And the plumber says, well, it's $300. He says, come on, 10 minutes of work, you know, $300? He says, I'm a brain surgeon. I can't get there for 10, that for 10 minutes of work, let alone in cash. And the plumber says, I feel your pain. It was the same for me when I was a heart surgeon. Okay. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes we have to face change that is difficult. And uh, I mean, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, day before yesterday, I took an Uber and the guy told me he's a dentist. Okay, so oh. that's my plumber that was a heart surgeon, right? right. And, and I'm like, what gives? And he says, look, I, I was going to retire in a few years, but Comfort Dental has made it so difficult and billing is so complicated and the insurance is so expensive. It says, I wasn't enjoying it anymore. And I love this. I love it. It says, I'm making a living. And uh, so how do people like that decide I'm going to go from being a dentist to being an Uber driver? You, know, you can only imagine the people around him are saying, are you insane? Are you insane, right? Yes. How does a successful hotel operator become a professional speaker? Sure. You know? So sometimes change is imposed on us by comfort dental. Sometimes change is imposed of us by illness, okay? Other times change is imposed of us by significant changes in the things that are happening around us, okay? Absolutely. A divorce, okay? What is a divorce? A divorce is a, is a couple that has grown apart for whatever series of reasons, okay? But they have failed to see the changes that were happening in each other over time okay? sure. and address them as they happened. Okay. And they allowed them to get to a point where they became unsurmountable and difficult. Yeah. So now they're faced with a change of separation. They'd still change. Okay. Absolutely. And they could have changed the way that they do things and, 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 and rescue the marriage. But sometimes the healthy thing is to get the divorce. Right. Right. And get out of a toxic situation absolutely the, the trick is 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 in in being curious you know when i do my talk the first thing that i say is that when our forefathers spent the declaration of independence and they said that we have the inalienable right to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness that they condemned us to the pursuit of happiness okay and I say happiness is not something you pursue. Something is happiness is something you choose to be, choose to be. Because if, if 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 happiness is something I pursue, then I would say, well, I'll be happy when somebody invents a stem cell that can regenerate my optic nerve and oh. restore my eyesight. Right. Does that mean that I'm deprived of happiness because I'm blind? Or is 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 happiness in the process? of doing, getting things done. And it's happiness in knowing that I can ski. So we, too many times in life, we expect or allow change to be the catalyst for happiness or unhappiness, right? I'm married, yay, I'm happy, okay. And I'm divorced, yay, I'm happy. Okay. <laughs> so where, 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 why is it that we feel that happiness is something we pursue rather than something we adopt and we choose to be happy regardless? So 
yes, I lost my eyesight, I lost my job, I got cancer, metastasized, okay, whatever. Does that mean I have to be unhappy? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. So it's changed, right? And now, so do you then choose that when, when they tell you you've got cancer and you're, you know, and, but the doctor told me, says, if I, if this happened five years ago, I would have been telling you to get your affairs in order. But today I tell you that if we can get you on this, on this test and we use this experimental drug, my goal is to cure you, not extend your life. Awesome. Awesome attitude from the doctor. Awesome attitude from the doctor, right? So are you curious enough to hear those things or do you want to choose to filter out and to hear you got cancer, it's a death sentence, go and look. My uncle, that happened to my uncle. He got a diagnosis of cancer. He went up to his room. He had them put black curtains in, on his, uh, in his room oh. and, uh, and just waited for death, okay? And six months later, he was dead. And- Oh my gosh. And, and to me, is there a time in life where you say, you know what? Okay, diagnosis is this, there's nothing else we can do, okay, so, so forth. But do you choose in those six months to just live them in darkness or do you choose to still be happy, you know? So, so what I'm saying is regardless of the diagnosis is, regardless of what happens, regardless of what the change is, okay, you can choose to be curious about exploring things and finding things that bring joy into your life. And that, you know, my granddaughter was born four months ago. And oh, I don't congratulations. Thank you. I don't see her face. So do I want to be in the pain of not seeing her face or do I want to be in the joy of feeling her and, uh, and, 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 and hear her gurgle and whatever. And my daughter got married two weeks ago and I gave her away. And uh, no, I didn't see the gorgeous bride. Okay. And, but I can make out the outline and so, so forth. And the joy of walking her down the aisle and crying at the altar when I gave her away. Yes. So the, the, the life is so full of, of, of wonderful opportunities if we're open to see them instead of seeing the darkness. Absolutely. That's a way to bring it home. Absolutely. I can um, see that you have embraced so much of this. And I love that you're out trying to help other people change how they think about uh, either change imposed on them well, I want to bring you back to that same question I asked just a little bit ago. What, what do you encourage people to do if they're surrounded by people who are trying to force them not to change? What, do you have a strategies or, you know, because I think a lot of us, we live in this script and part of that script comes from outside of us and the people reinforce, hey, this is who you are and how you live. How do you help people break out of that when they're stuck with those voices and those people around them? You know, so I worked for a hotel company. Yes. They did themselves of being highly entrepreneurial. Okay. Okay. And, uh, and they put Marriott down because seeing Marriott is all by the book, it's all by the SOP manuals, and you've, we are entrepreneurial. Okay. But then when you come down to the department head and the division head level, okay, or the supervisor, and so, so forth, they still have SOPs and they're still tied by procedures and stuff and, and so within your department within your division within my hotel okay i can choose to say you know what the organization says we have to do it this way but i am choosing to stay within the guidelines okay but to operate with more freedom and to give you more and we all have the choice to do that. So if we have a supervisor that won't let us be curious, okay, it doesn't mean that we can't make small improvements okay, on our own okay, sure. and, and get things done in, in, in my small area. Okay? So if I can improve flow by doing my small things without bothering my supervisor. It, it happened to me, I was at the Hotel Fierjahreszeiten in Hamburg 
when I was a, a bus boy. And I had this idea and I go running to the Metro D and I go, hey, book, I just, I, I just was thinking. He says, hold it. I don't pay you to think, I pay you to do. So go and do. The classic line. The classic line, right? So does that mean that I let him beat me down and, uh, and, uh, and that I stop? Mm -hmm. Or do I let my innate nature say, no, I want to bring a change about and I'm going to change this. Mm -hmm. And yes, it can be risky. And sometimes you're a heart surgeon, you become a plumber because you're fed up of all the naysaying around you. You change companies, okay? You hate the company that, you, that you're that you in and, and you feel that you can do more. You become an entrepreneur, you do your own thing. You get out of the marriage of the naysayers, okay? Uh -huh. You have to take action, you know, to move forward in life and to let curiosity lead you. Uh, you have to take risk, and uh, it, 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 many times curiosity, you know, I mean, uh, curiosity killed the cat, right? <laughs> but satisfaction brought him back, right? So, right. so be curious. Uh, uh, another story, so I, I was uh, working at the Hotel Internacional Iguazu. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Iguazu Falls. I don't think so. The Iguazu Falls are in the border between Brazil, Paraguay, and Argentina, and they are phenomenal. They are 286 towering feet tall. There are hundreds on my bucket list. Than Niagara. What's that? I think that goes goes on mine and probably a lot of people's bucket list. Yes, it is, and it's in the middle of the jungle in a pristine setting. Okay, oh. not like Niagara with all the stores and stuff and commerce around it. And I opened a hotel there as front office manager. And the hotel, as I said, is in the jungle. And it's connected to the world through a um, copper wire, okay, that brought in telex and telephone. This is back in the uh, 70s. Okay. But the line was down more than it was up. So, so our connection to Buenos Aires was very tenuous. And uh, July 9th is beginning of winter holiday in Argentina. Okay. And uh, so reservations should be pouring in because everyone wants to go north to escape the cold. Okay, everyone wants to come north. So remember, Argentina, the south, south, right, the south side of the world is reverse, right? <laughs> right. So the phone is not ringing. So I go to my boss and I'm going like again. You know, I've been thinking and I'm saying, why don't we let Buenos Aires control part of our inventory, and they can then sell rooms for us, and when the lines are up they can send burst transmissions to us and catch us up. And it's going like, you're crazy. Okay, you're crazy. He says, he grabbed his side whiskers that wear gray hair. And he says, this is wisdom. You know, <laughs> he says, you, you, you need to understand, okay, that if, 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 they, if they oversell us, okay, and we end up overbooked here in the middle of the jungle, what do we do with our guests? Put them on hammocks between the mosquitoes and the monkeys? He says, no way, we're not doing it. So the reservations were not coming in and we got it close to the day and I run into the job manager and he say, hey, how's it going? And I told him my idea. He says, let's implement it. So I did. So my boss comes, comes running in, spitting in my face. I mean, he is so angry, right? He is spewing. He's got gang grabbing his whiskey. He says, you see, this is wisdom. Okay. And you don't come with your stupid ideas and override me. You're fired. Okay. Whoa. So he... He fired me. And I, I was living in the hotel because we were, you know, I was there just for three months for a summer vacation from Cornell, from school when I went down to do this. And so I was wrapping things up. And the next day he comes in and he says, Andresito, the general manager told me to unfire you. Okay, <laughs> so it has a, it, the story has a good ending, but I feel that it, I could not sit there quite in. Was I arrogant and did I say it the wrong way? And was I cocky? Maybe. Okay. But we need to learn to discern between the message and the delivery. And so many times we get so hung up on the delivery rather than listening to the message and not being curious. Okay. But I felt that I could not hold my peace. I was not going to sit there. I would rather get fired and implement a good idea, then sit back and 
I was, I was, I was uh, talking with a friend of mine and uh, he grew up, he's from Spain and he grew up in Puerto Rico. And there is a saying there and that's, it, it, it's que se joda, okay? And uh, it is like, uh, oh, uh, let him get screwed, okay, kind okay. of thing. And it's that mentality of, hey, I don't want to do anymore, okay? Let, 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 let them get screwed because they're, they're doing it to me, I'm doing it to them. Isn't it sad that we get into those mentalities and what happened then to our culture and, and or to our organization or to our family when our attitude is about letting the negativity around us about don't change, okay? Right. Pervasive and permeate and, and, and dictate the way that you conduct your life. Yes. So my goal is to get you out of that mode and to get you to be curious, to challenge what is happening around you, even if it means going from heart surgeon to plumber. Uh -huh. So it, it, um, we, it's difficult. I know that it is difficult and that when you're surrounded in an organization that doesn't want to change, well, let me tell you what. Change is going to bring the corporation down, okay? And uh, so go and do something else and, and go. And in today's world, where is unemployment at 2.9%, to me, it is ludicrous for you to be unhappy at work. Agreed. Because there are people looking for jobs. So if, if my son got a degree in marketing from CU, that got a couple of jobs and hated it. And then quit into my chagrin and despair. Here is the curious guy, right? Uh -huh. He decides to go and uh, be a line cook at Sweet Tomatoes, making minimum wage. Okay. And I was going crazy. I was going crazy. Okay. And then one day he says, Dad, I want to be an electrician. And now he's a year into his apprenticeship and loving it. And the joy in his face is just so rewarding to see him happy. It took him a while. And sure. I, th I thought he was not being curious and that he had given up, but no. And uh, so it takes some of us a little longer and <laughs> difficult. Yes, indeed. Um, but I talked a lot about um, dealing with change. Okay. Right. But the thing is, if you're not being curious, then you're not anticipating and creating change. Okay, so I've been looking backwards. Now, let's turn around and look forward, okay? Okay. And, and see, how, how do we make change? So I talk about incremental change. Okay, so you're an organization, you're a London cab driver, and uh, every month you do something a little bit different to make it better, okay? You put air conditioning in your car and uh, you give a bottle of water to your uh, uh, clients and uh, you put a little television in the back, uh, you put leather seats, whatever, okay? But every month you do incremental improvements. Okay. All of a sudden you read in the paper that this strange thing called Uber is coming into town and any kid with an iPhone and a car, it's gonna compete with you. In London, it takes two years and three months to become a licensed cab driver. Wow. Going to school, you have to learn. London is a very complex city. It's not set up in a grid, okay? Yes, and I've so, been lost there. <laughs> you have been lost there. Yes. <laughs> so you have to learn how to get from here to here at three o'clock in the afternoon. And, uh, but how do you get from here to here at eight o'clock in the morning? What is different? Okay. Sure. And you have to know basic mechanics of your car and you have to learn customer service and all of these things to, to, to nearly two and a half years. Okay. And now anybody with an iPhone can come and compete with you. So my thing is, do you you say, well, I'm going to fight them, fight them, fight them, fight them. You say, well, maybe I need to join them like Hamid did. Or you say, 
is it time right now that I'm still making a good income as a cab driver? Okay, do I see the writing on the wall? On the wall, and do I need to go and learn something different, something new? Do I want to go in a different direction? Is this the sign that I was waiting for to choose a different career, like my son Evan did? Okay, so yes, making change. You know, it's it's a. I, I am an admirer of Steve Jobs. And th Steve Jobs was a disruptor. Absolutely. And, uh, he disrupted the telephone industry. You know, um, Steve Ballmer, the CEO of Microsoft, when the iPhone was announced the next day, he famously said, the iPhone is an expensive bottle. Apple does not know telephony. Is he eating his words today? Oh, uh, big time. <laughs> what about the movie industry with, with Pixar? Okay, with Pixar and uh, how he revolutionized how animation happens. What about the iPad and how he has revolutionized how we read books and uh, how we consume the internet, okay? Yes. So he was a disruptor. He, it, it, there's very few of us that can get to that level. Okay, I also think he was, as a human being, non-functional, okay? It was very <laughs> difficult to deal with him. Right. And the people surrounded him said he lived in an altered reality world. Okay. Yeah. So we can, we cannot, I'm not talking about that kind of disruption. That's, that just happens once in a lifetime. Sure. Whatever. Sure. It may happen more often now with technology, but, uh, but your life can be disrupted by your wife saying, I'm leaving. Okay. Yeah. Your, your life can be disrupted by you losing your job. Okay, et cetera, et cetera. And how do you prepare for that? And, 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 and how do you anticipate that? And I'm saying it is through being curious and having a, 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 in your department, your division, and your organization, a thing where curiosity is such that you can anticipate what is happening around you. And so, case in point, when... Um, they say that uh, Henry Ford said this, but it's not true. But uh, they, they, allegedly, Henry Ford said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse. Right. Yes, I've heard that. <laughs> okay. But when the horseless carriage came out, nobody was curious enough to truly understand what this was. Okay. And people, everybody wrote it off and they're going like, it's stupid. Look how noisy it is. It has to get gas. How are you going to get gas when you're traveling? And it needs a road to travel on. Where are the roads? Okay. Right. It's, it's, it's doomed. It's, it's not going anywhere. Okay. And people stayed with horses. And the problem is that the cycle of adoption is getting, you know, that took maybe 50 years or, or two generations, okay, for it to truly make an impact, okay. But think today about the driverless car and, and how uncurious many people are and they're saying it's not going anywhere, it's not going to happen, okay. It's going to disrupt the world the way we know it. We will no longer own our cars, because our cars sit idle 85 to 90% of the time, okay? So why have an asset that is idle? Why not have an, a, a, in the shared economy where you just call through an app, call for a car that comes and picks you up and takes you somewhere for a fraction of the cost of owning the car? Right. But it's going to disrupt the insurance industry because we won't own the car, so we don't need car insurance. It's going to disrupt the tire industry because... Yes, those cars will need tires, but they will not be distributed through they go tire anymore. And it's, it, we won't be buying cars in dealerships anymore. So dealerships are going to go away and mechanics are going to go away. So think of the disruption that the autonomous parking, parking garages, garages. We won't need garages in our homes anymore. Right. Okay. So the disruption that is coming from this is monumental, but we're not seeing it. We, we, we're not curious enough. And, but if I was in one of those industries, you know, I'd be urging my team to say, okay, how are we going to adapt or how are we going to change? What, what are we going to do different? Okay. So, you know, Kodak invented digital photography in yeah. Japan. You know that uh, uh, Wozniak, Steve Wozniak invented the Apple computer while working for HP. Yeah. And when, 
when Steve Jobs told him and say, hey, let's put this in a box and sell it. And Waz said, no, 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 this belongs to HP. And Steve said, so what? They don't know. And he said, oh, no, I need to tell them. So he went and told them and showed it to them and says, we're not interested. Yeah. The, today, the most valuable company in the world. HP, yep. said, we're not interested. Okay. So, I, and, and, you know, and there's things that, again, being a Monday morning quarterback, but it's that, that, that lack of curiosity that sometimes you say, okay, my core industry is not computers. My core industry is calculators, okay, whatever. So sure. and you say, no, it's not where you want to go. And I understand it. It's, it makes sense sometimes, okay? But that is how you let opportunities sometimes slip through. So to move forward, my feeling is remain curious about everything that is happening around you. And when somebody comes to your office, and tells you and says, I have an idea. Put stuff down. Even you've got to be preparing your board report or tell them, say, tell you what, can you make an appointment? Can, can, can we meet tomorrow? Can we, you know, do management by wandering around MBWA. Okay, talk to your people, hear them out. Certainly, certainly. And hear your children out. And I think that it won't protect you from being disrupted, but it, it'll, make you better prepared to be one of the people that is disrupting rather than being disrupted. It, you know, and when you see organizations and, uh, you know, take something like a McDonald's, okay, whatever, and they understand that the market preferences are changing. Okay? Yes. And they're being curious about how to adapt to the changes, okay, and, uh, or, or, or take, uh, you know, a company like, um, Oh man, coffee, um, Starbucks. Starbucks, okay. You know, and they say, oh, we're not gonna do straws anymore that are plastic because we as consumers are getting concerned about the billions of straws. So it's that level of curiosity, I think. And, and let's do cold beverages in summer, okay? That we're not just a coffee company anymore. Right. And, and there may be a day where they're no longer a coffee company because they keep morphing and reinventing themselves and changing and adapting through incremental changes and sometimes through significant change. So step out of the organizational world for a minute. Do humans function the same way? Can we be the same thing like a Starbucks where our curiosity is continually evolving and changing who we are? It's a leading question, I know. <laughs> yes, yes, you know, you know, and it's who we are, right? I mean, it's, it's a, how did we get from the cave to today? Right. You know, and uh, it's because in, in, in an evolutionary way, we, we are curious. It's, uh, we, without curiosity, we'd be monkeys, right? <laughs> sure. And without curiosity, we would not have the language, we would not have developed uh, our implements, and we would not have the, invented the wheel and so, so forth. So is, is, is being curious as a human being, is that innately part of who we are, of, of all of us? I think some of us have to wake it up. Okay, so, so it gets beat out of us at some point in life, you think? And that's what I was saying about my Metro D and, yeah. in, in Hamburg and my boss at the Iwasu, that, you know, it, it's our children in the car when we, you know, are we there yet? And, uh, you know, we beat it out of them. It, the, why is the sky blue? And uh, it, it, uh, that it gets to the point where we just kill that curiosity kind of thing. And in our employees, in, in, in our employees in, in, in around us. So that's why I'm saying it's so imperative for organizations to create an environment where it is safe to be curious. Watson, I forget what his first name was, the, the, the founder of IBM. Right. There's this famous anecdote, okay, whatever, that uh, in, in, I'm not being very specific because I don't know the details, but. Uh, this executive vice president comes in and says, hey, the project you gave me, we lost a million dollars and uh, I failed you. Here's my letter of resignation. And Watson takes the letter, rips it up. He says, you crazy? 
your training just cost me a million dollars. You think I'm going to let you go to the competition? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and it's that's the mentality that we need to have to saying it's safe to fail. You know, it is safe to, as long as the failure had a purpose, it not being mindless and stupid like generals were in World War I, just getting soldiers and feeding them to the machine guns. Okay. Sure. And uh, just action for action's sake, okay. It's it's be be uh, wise about. Uh, so one of the things when when they talk about the wisdom of my old boss, you know, and I say, well, so what's more important organization? Is it wisdom, or is it curiosity? Mm. And I think both play a significant role because wisdom prevents us from repeating the mistakes from the past. Right. But curiosity is what propels us forward. But too many times we, we, we say that, that it is that curiosity that got us in trouble. So we want to kill the curiosity through wisdom. So you need to come to a, to a safe interplay of, the, of both. So that both curiosity and uh, intellect come into, into, into play together safely. Sure. And uh, so that you use the, so if, if I was curious at the Hotel Iguazu and I said, hey, let's go outside and sell the thing, instead of his intellect saying, oh, they're going to oversell us and they're going to get us in trouble, if, if he maybe had stopped and said, interesting idea, Andre, but if they oversell us, how can we prevent that? And let's sit down and talk about it. And how can we take this? kernel of an idea and hammer it into something usable. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So that's why I think that there is a, a, a very important interaction between the two. And uh, absolutely. We need the intellect, and, uh, and, and, but curiosity is what propels us forward. That is, yes, absolutely. So I want to ask a hypothetical question here, and obviously there's no absolutes in this, but you have become extremely curious through the experience of becoming blind and through those months, years. Transition. Of, yeah, that become, you know, taking that and embracing the transition itself. What would have happened to you uh, had you not become blind? What would have happened if when you laid down on that mountaintop, if you'd have just stood back up later and got on your bike? I'd be the CEO of the Denver Athletic Club, maybe, or another club or, or something like that. Um, adversity sometimes forces us to take action in directions that we never expected. It showed me a strength. So when, when I was in school, I was at a... Um, uh, private British school in Argentina as a day boarder, and we went all to school. And uh, I was bullied. I was severely bullied in school. And uh, so, you know, it, it's it's um, it was difficult. It was a very difficult time in my life. And at one point, I, I literally went crying to my father, and I said, "I I need to get out of here. I I, I please please." put me somewhere else. My dad sat me down and told me, he says, you know, Andre, the, 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 if I can change your school, that you will still be you. And the reasons that you're being bullied in this school will be the same reasons why you will be bullied in the next school. The one who needs to change is you, not mm. the school. Hmm. It was a difficult lesson that I, whose message didn't get through to me for a long time. Okay. Sure. And, um, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, you remember the, uh, the book Unbroken or the, the, the movie Unbroken? Yes. And, um, so he was rigid in his determination to not let the bird tame him or break his will, okay? And, and I applaud him and I, I, I that was, Samparini was his name. And, yeah. uh, and I'm going like, wow, 
you know, what an example of perseverance. But on the other hand, I'm going like, okay, and, and that's what I was doing. I was being bullied and they wanted me to, you know, to smoke and I wouldn't smoke. And uh, I cut my hair the way I was supposed to. And I sat at the front of the class, okay, and whatever. And, and I didn't want to change those things. And to me, it was important to be who I am. And, and I think it, that through my life, it, it has developed my character rather than weaken it. But in looking, what would my life have been if at that point I had flexed a little bit? And rather than standing rigidly in the middle of the river and fighting it and resisting it, if I had just given up a little bit, okay? And how much is it important to give up some instead of just being stubborn? And if I had remained stubborn, I would not want, wanting to get on a tandem. I just would not have had the joy of doing Ride the Rockies, okay? So being on top of that mountain and not going blind would not have created the uh, one attention of forcing to make choices. And uh, if Uber had not come into town, Hamid would not have made the switch, okay? So I, I, I think that I've always been curious. That's why all those places at 12 city continent sure. companies. I built stereos and I, I built computers. And uh, so I've always been, you know, I, I, I did a lot of carpentry stuff and I, I've always been curious about how to fix things and do things. Okay. But that was just, again, incremental changes and not significant changes like the change that happened the mountain top. Right. So I, I think that sometimes when massive change comes, okay, uh, you can be not curious and stop. And, uh, and we know people like that. Yes, yes. We know people like that. We know people that give up. You know, and love him or hate him, okay, uh, our, our president, uh, it, the way he's doing curious enough about one, do things in a complete different way than they have been done before. Is he achieving much? I don't know yet. Okay. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, my, my, my daughter was supposed to, was, had to write a, a uh, article on a uh, person that she admires for his or her uh, public relations abilities. She got a degree in public relations and she chose Pablo Escobar. Interesting. Okay, you remember Pablo Escobar, the cartel? Yes. Okay. But the guy was a genius, a genius in public relations. Okay. And the thing is, you know, so sometimes, and, and that is what, what pains me is that once we judge a situation, we stop being curious about of any good that they're doing. So when Obama was president, okay, there was a whole part of the population that was going like, he's selling us out and, uh, you know, and uh, he's terrible for the country and he's not a citizen. And then they stopped being curious about all the great things that he did. And I think the same is happening now with the current president. Okay, so I'm not saying that one was better than the other. I'm, I'm staying apolitical here. I have a picture of a tandem bicycle where the two riders are back to back to each other. Okay. <laughs> And, and I say, okay, so this bicycle is Congress and the Republicans are the captains and the Democrats are the stokers. I said, they're both patriots, right? They're both true patriots. And they really, really, really believe that their way is the way to take the country forward. Right. And, but they're not going anywhere. They're not going there. They're blocking each other and they're stopping progress because they are not allowing themselves to be curious about, all right, you do have a good point, but how can we make it so that it works for both of us and the art of compromise? Okay. I think some of that is, I totally agree, it's missing. Yes, it is missing. So I think that if we all put a little bit more curiosity, we allow ourselves to be curious about each other, 
and if, if you and your wife are in an argument and you say, okay, so uh, let me make sure that I understand your point and you repeat her point, rather than fighting for your point, mm -hmm. you, you, you might have a better way of maybe, I, I'm not saying that you've compromised yet. And, and there are things, you know, if you believe that abortion is murder, you can't see one abortion happen because it's one murder. So you say, how can I compromise on it? But if you see giving birth to an unwanted child as destruction of two lives, okay, then you can't see a world where abortion is not permitted, okay? Right. And so there's some points where compromise is very, very hard to yes. read. Absolutely. And so I'm not saying that it's a magic bullet and that it's a solution to everything. It isn't. But curiosity is a help in a lot. And I think a curious mind will take you a hell of a lot farther than a closed one. I absolutely agree. Well, Andre, thank you so much for all this time today. I've got I only got a couple more questions left here. Um, one, I want to make sure we get, um, if, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, hire you as a speaker, uh, how do they go about doing that? Well, it's I've got a great website, and okay. uh, it's www.andrevanhall.com, and Van Hall is V-A-N-H-A-L-L, -L, so just as it sounds, andrevanhall.com altogether. Great. And uh, my phone number is 720-339-4831. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I always ask uh, one last question, um, which is... All right. Uh, uh, Colombo. <laughs> like, oh, I never thought of it that way, but yes. <laughs> well, uh, maybe more so than I thought in some ways, but here, here's the question. What's the one question that I forgot to ask you? Hmm. Yes, it's... Uh, I, I, I did a lot of talk, but, you know, it's... Um, I think... Am I happy? What's the answer? And the answer is absolutely, you know, and uh, it's, I, I have so much joy and in what I'm doing, joy of being in this country at this time, joy of uh, the support and the help of the community and the people, and then the ability of me to pay it forward and to do it for others. Awesome. And uh, so, so many times we, we, we're looking at the changes that are happening around us and, and is, is, is it global warming or is it climate change? And uh, the reality is it's happening and what's causing it or not causing it, okay? Uh, but should that rob us from the ability to just be glad that it's another day? It's warmer than it was yesterday, okay? but it is another glorious day in the world. So do we want to let all that negativity bring us down and prevent us from having joy in our lives and uh, of, of uh, the joy of this interview or the opportunity of talking with you? This has been so, <laughs> so tremendous, you know, so I, 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 my answer to you is yes. We, I'm happy, and uh, and I hope that with what I shared with you today, that I can plant a seed or a kernel of curiosity and people out there to understand that if they just choose to be curious and choose to be happy, they can make the world that they want to see. I cannot think of a better place to stop than right there. Thank you so much for taking some time to talk to me, and I am looking forward to uh, you changing the world. Thank you very much. Uh, we can do it together. I appreciate it. 